Our speaker today is a, a wonderful colleague in the work here. Um, and first and foremost, I need to say she's the only person I know that commutes six hours to work. Um, and last week she hit a deer. Um, and um, I, I still think the deer said something about the book of Ezekiel that she didn't agree with. <laughs> um, but uh, we are blessed with a very remarkable academic dean. Um, just to, to run through some of the things, and it was interesting, uh, Mary and Jen did some homework on her, her background, and I found out some things that she never even talks to me about. So I, I learned some things even going through her uh, CV. But she's a summa cum laude graduate of Wheaton College, a summa cum laude of Westminster Theological Seminary, and a PhD at Westminster. And I still remember when we first interviewed her for a full-time faculty position, um, they said, what did you do academically for your PhD? And she said, I did the proverbial sayings uh, of Ezekiel um, for my PhD. And she said, the only reason why I did it was because it was the only topic left. Um, um, but the, but the, the biblical scholars in the room knew that this was probably the most difficult subject you could have. And so the immediate respect that came when, when her topic was announced. Um, she's contributed to the Everyday Study Bible, the Women's Study Bible, the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery, the New Dictionary of Apologetics, Dictionary of Old Testament Wisdom, Poetry and Writings, Presence, Power and Promise, the Role of the Spirit of God in the Old Testament. She's co-authored the Psalms with, um, as Christian worship, uh, and she's also, um, a part of the Psalms as Christian Lament with Bruce Watke and James Houston. Um, and uh, um, her passion, her love for the Psalms has, has been evident in that she's part of the new translation team. They're retranslating the Coverdale uh, Psalter. We're blessed to have Erica as our academic dean, and she is one who inspires, encourages, and challenges us as a leader. So Erica, would you come and speak with us? Well, thank you so much for coming today, and thank you, Mary, for asking me to share for a few minutes. And I just want to talk for a few minutes on the critical need of a place like Trinity at a time like this in our culture. So as Lori mentioned, I love horses, okay? And last May, my husband Jim, son Philip, and I had the extraordinary experience of going to the Kentucky Derby. It was a dear gift from dear friends, and we spent two days at Churchill Downs. And so we're moseying around, and it was just exciting. There were races all day, and you know it's all building up to the Saturday 6.43 post time for the fastest two minutes in sports. And as we're moseying around Churchill Downs, I realized that there was only one life-size statue of a horse at Churchill Downs, and that was Barbaro. Now that intrigued me because as a lover of horses, I had followed Barbaro's career. And back in 2006, all the buzz was that Barbaro would be the first Triple Crown winner since Secretariat had done that way, way back in 1973. And so Barbaro won the Kentucky Derby handily back in 2006. And then two weeks later, out of the starting blocks at the Preakness, he broke three bones in his right hind ankle. And he was whisked off to a, a center called the New Bolton Center outside of Philadelphia, where they tried to nurse him back to health, but then it was either January or February 2007, he was euthanized. And so because I love horses, I was following Barbaro's progress during that time. And I would scratch my head when I'd learned that people were sending Barbaro carrots and apples and peppermints and get well cards and carrots. And I just found that a, a little odd. And we actually had a student here about five or six years ago who was a vet at the New Bolton Center. And he assured me that this was true. This was not fake news, okay? He would actually go to work and there'd be a six foot card there for Barbaro, okay? And again, I love horses. Two years ago, we moved from Pittsburgh to Syracuse. 
And when the realtor would call and say, oh, Erica, you know, we have a house for you and Jim to look at, my first questions were not, well, tell me about the master bedroom, tell me about the kitchen, does it have a dining room? My questions were always, tell me about the barn and the pasture. And so because of that, my horses right now are living in the barn of their dreams. I am not living in the house of my dreams, okay? <laughs> I really do love horses. But with all my love for horses, it never occurred to me after working at Trinity all day to stop at the Hallmark store and buy a card for Barbaro. Just never occurred to me. Well, I was listening to, the new, uh, to some program and the pundit George Will was commenting on a similar phenomenon that happened when Princess Di died. Five million people in the streets of London. Well, obviously not personal friends. And what he said was, his observ observation was people want to be part of the bigger story. They want to connect their lives with something bigger than them that's out there. And I think that George Will is on to something. People are looking for some sort of narrative that can sustain them, that they can connect with. Listen to what Craig Dykstra, he's a professor at Duke, what he says. Without a narrative that sustains us, the world and we ourselves are virtually phantom. But the issue is not just whether one has a narrative or not. The issue is whether we have one that is true and genuine, one that can sustain us in reality, one that having been, giving it, been given it and having committed it to memory, frees us from desperately having to continue to make one up. We need a genuine, real, sustaining narrative. And of course, as believers, we profess by faith that it's that Christian narrative that we have in scripture that provides the underlying and overarching explanation for all the details in our lives and for everything in the world. So Dykstra is correct. And yet the challenge is that this need for a true and sustaining narrative is being countered in our culture. Now, on one level, there are a lot of competing narratives that are out there that vie for our allegiance. But I think even more insidiously, there's a trend to deny that such a thing as a meta-narrative even exists. And here in America, our sense of purpose and progress, I think to a significant degree, has since our country's inception been sustained by the Christian narrative. And as that narrative recedes, not just from public approval, but from public knowledge, the very idea that there's any narrative flow to history becomes much less plausible and much more suspect. As one Anglican bishop has observed, and I quote, in the West, the world has lost its story. We've lost the sense that the world is a narratable reality. And without a meaningful origin, without a meaningful and purposive eschaton, history becomes a tale not tellable at all, not even by an idiot, unquote. Where there's no meaningful origin, where there's no eschaton, there's simply no hope. Now, there are certainly attempts to fabricate optimism, but that's not biblical hope. It's a byproduct of faltering attempts to imitate the truth. So the question becomes, how do we proclaim the Christian narrative to and in a culture that's not only increasingly more allergic to the very idea of a meta-narrative, but, but it's also beset by a condition known as liquid modernity. Liquid modernity. Now, the term was coined by sociolo sociologist Zygmunt Bauman. And Bauman was a Jew from Poland, he was an ex-Stalinist, and he was the chair of the Department of Sociology at Leeds in, in England for several decades, and, and he died last year. And, and he found that, that the terms modernity and postmodernity were simply deficient, and so he replaced them with solid and liquid modernity because he thought that that more accurately reflected the basic contrast he saw between uh, the two periods of time. And for Bauman, liquid modernity more aptly described the unprecedented constant mobility and change that he saw occurring in relationships, identities, global economies in our contemporary societies. 
And in 1999, he wrote a book by that, by that title, Liquid Modernity. And he documents the changes in society. And he particularly focused on the velocity of change and the permanent transition that characterizes human societies on a global scale. And according to Bauman's analysis, societal forms, relationships, and institutions no longer have enough time to solidify, and consequently, they can't serve as frames of reference for human actions and long-term life planning. And that leaves individuals with the need to find other ways to navigate and organize their lives. According to Bauman, this dismal state of affairs has become normative for individuals, institutions, cultures, and the results are disintegration, diffusion, and a strong sense of isolation. He compared the liquid modern person to a tourist, an individual who flows through their own life, changing jobs, spouses, where they live, political affiliations, sexual orientation, sexual identity, all the while freeing themselves from traditional networks of support and from, of course, then the restrictions or requirements that those networks impose. And of course, this experience of dislocation is going to affect people's ability to live ethical and deeply meaningful lives. Let me quote Bauman here, quote, in liquid modern life, there are no permanent bonds, and any that we take up for a time must be tied loosely so that they can be untied again as quickly and as effortlessly as possible when circumstances change. So in other words, what he's saying is all relationships that we enter have to have an until further notice nuance, freeing people to abandon them at any time in as frictionless a manner as possible. And so Bauman urges his reader to be flexible towards the future. That's a face as soon as it comes and becomes history. So he continues, quote, most importantly, unlike our ancestors, we don't have a clear image of a destination. And dear friends, individuals, institutions, and cultures without such moorings in which anything and everything that we value and prize today has an inevitable expiration date can only, in my opinion, lead to a future that is both rootless and ruthless. Now, Bauman is strong on description, not so much on prescription. He's a sociologist, after all, so he's interested in describing how things are rather than how things ought to be. Ought to be. But I think his critical description of liquid modernity provides us with a fruitful backdrop against which to consider the needs of orthodox theological education that can answer these challenges raised by this liquid milieu in which we currently live. I think we would all agree that liquid modernity has opened the door for liquid ontology. And such a context of chaos and confusion simply underscores the vital need for a place like Trinity School for Ministry. We have a mission statement here at Trinity. Trinity School for Ministry is an evangelical seminary in the Anglican tradition. In this fractured world, we desire to, I should know this by heart, be a global center for Christian formation, producing outstanding leaders who can renew, plant, and grow churches that make disciples of Jesus Christ. We're in the business of forming Christian leaders for mission. And I'm convinced that the model that we have here at Trinity for teaching and formation provides precisely the types of preparations that are needed to combat the crises of the day. So what do we focus here at, on Trinity? Well, the first thing we focus on is knowledge. Christian ministers need to know things. First and foremost, they need to know their scripture. And we're not talking about just lots and lots of knowledge. Okay? There's lots of people with lots of knowledge about the scripture, but they don't understand the redemptive significances of what they know. And so what I'm talking about here is Trinity's emphasis on biblical theology. The idea that there is a narrative contained in the canon of our scriptures that coheres and finds its fulfillment in the person, 
the work and the teaching of Jesus Christ. So students here learn to, who hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the scriptures uh, so that they can be effective ministers proclaiming the gospel of Christ. They learn theology, they learn ethics, they learn liturgy, they learn spirituality, all the things that are needed for them to become effective ministers of the gospel. Now, I'm here to also say very confidently that contrary to popular caricatures of, as to what goes on in the classroom, it's not some mysterious process whereby information passes from the notes of the professor to the notes of the student without going through the minds of either. either. That simply does not matter, happen here at Trinity, okay? And the reason that is, is because our teaching here is deeply relational. You saw that in the video, video, how many of the students commented on the relationship between themselves and amongst themselves and between the professors. Professors know their students. Students know their professors. And professors pray for their students. We get together every Wednesday at 1.30, every semester, and pray as a faculty. And oftentimes, we bring the needs of our students before the Lord as a united faculty. Professors know and love their students. And engagement and learning doesn't just take place in the classroom. It takes place during lunch time together. We eat lunches together, Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, we invite families. So folks who have their children here who aren't in school come here on Thursdays, and we have family lunch. We spend time with students outside of the classroom. Uh, Lori mentioned in chapel this morning one of our Mennonite students, Kyle. So we have two Mennonite students here, Kyle and Josh, and they're both intimately involved in a Mennonite school north of here between Mercer and Erie. And at the first faculty prayer time this, this semester, one of my colleagues on the faculty shared how this summer, he and his wife were driving up to Erie, and they stopped and they visited the school where Kyle and Josh teach. And what a joy and encouragement it was for one of their professors to go and visit them in their ministry context. That's, I, could, I could spend the rest of the day up here telling you about that sort of thing that the faculty do, the way that they invest in the lives of the students around here. Learning at Trinity is deeply relational. We also focus on skills. Obviously, knowledge itself is insufficient, and so we focus on equipping the students with the skills needed for effective Christian ministry. Skills of listening, how to conduct worship, how to preach, how to teach, how to counsel those who are seeking God's wisdom, how to care for those in need. Uh, two weeks ago, one of our students started a, and I'm the Luddite here, so I sh I'm venturing into technology, but started a PayPal account or something for a neighbor who was in desperate need of help. And so I contacted Steve uh, the other day, and he said they, they received more above and beyond what their, their neighbor needed. They're learning how to care for one another here also. They're learning how to pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. And again, these skills are learned in the classroom. They're learned in the liturgical practicums that, that our Dean of Students uh, gives in both the fall and spring semester in the evenings. And they're learned by actually doing these things in real time and life. We have what are called leadership formation groups here at Trinity. And when students arrive, such as Michael and, and Crystal, their first year, they're assigned a leadership formation group. And except for extraordinary circumstances, they stay with that group until they graduate. And at least one week of the semester, each LFG group with the professor who's in charge are assigned chapel duty. And so the students get to learn all the different roles involved with morning prayer, evening prayer, Wednesday Eucharist. And we meet together in our LFGs every Wednesday at lunchtime except when we have brunch for the professors, <laughs> so they won't be meeting um, 
with the faculty quite at noon today. But all these ways the students get to actually practice, watch others, and internalize these skills for their future ministries. And then finally, and, and we heard it several times in the student um, testimonies, Trinity is about formation. Now, formation's a nice big buzzword today in seminaries, but it's, it's much more than that here at Trinity. It's something that we are deeply committed to as a faculty and as an institution. So how do we achieve formation? Well, we spent as a faculty, along with our director of online education and dean of students last year, a significant amount of time thinking about how to provide formation for our online students. We devoted an entire retreat in December to the topic. And, this, and then it was approved by our accrediting agency, and this spring we'll start in earnest. It, it's, it's a different animal than our residential program, but we're committed to providing formation even for our online students. And then here residentially, when you spend two to three years attending morning worship before you go to morning class, evening prayer after evening class, Wednesday Eucharist in, in, and out, LFGs every week, all this has an effect and impact on your character. These are the sorts of things that we do here at Trinity in order to engage in formation. And we do it with our Lutheran friends. We do it with our Presbyterian friends. We do it with our non-denominational friends that are here with us with our international students. Right now, residentially this semester, we have students from Uganda, Kenya, Nigeria, China, and Colombia. And they are an integral part of the formation process. We do it with international guests. We're, we're inviting or we're receiving um, a guest this weekend from Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, he's a gentleman by the name of Pervez Sultan, who is the principal of the Karachi Anglican Seminary in Pakistan. And he'll be spending a month with us on a sabbatical. And all these sorts of opportunities for the student help them to become global Christians in an Anglican context. The types of students that we are teaching and forming here at Trinity are precisely the types of Christian leaders needed in this ever-changing and challenging world. Christian leaders who have learned and been shaped by the drama of scripture, who have a robust knowledge of the faith as expressed in, as expressed in the confessions, the creeds, and the catechisms, and who are learning to walk humbly and independence before the Lord, Jesus Christ, and who understand that in an age of liquidity, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. They're learning to declare, when all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking stand. They're living to learn, they're learning to live in community, and they're learning how to model that once they leave here. And despite all the cultural protestations to the contrary, we know that what folks need is a genuine, true, sustaining narrative. And we know that at Trinity, we are preparing students to share that narrative of scripture in a winsome, prayerful, and powerful way to this fractured, liquid world. Thank you.